Welcome to the third in our three-part virtual excursions training program. My name is Jackie Randalls and I've coordinated this program for national delivery as part of my role managing Inspiring Australia in New South Wales. For those new to Inspiring Australia, it's the national strategy for public engagement with STEM. We work with hundreds of community partners to connect scientific researchers to big audiences. And today's training is all about doing just that in the virtual world. It will be produced and delivered by Physics Education, Sydney Science Education and Refraction Media. And I'd like to acknowledge support from the New South Wales Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer and Inspiring Australia's state programs in New South Wales, the ACT, Queensland, Western Australia and South Australia. It's our hope that with the skills you'll learn in this course, you'll be well equipped to deliver exciting online programs for National Science Week in August and at other times of the year. Do connect with the IA program in your state. Your state manager is listed on the contact page of the National Science Week website, where we encourage you to log your events as they're organised. Enjoy the training and please let us know how useful it is by completing the evaluation survey that will be sent to you after each session. Many thanks and I'll now hand over to Ben Newson from Physics Education. Yes, welcome everyone again to another uh, Inspiring Australia webinar series all about learning how to do online STEM festivals in lots and lots of different ways. Uh, welcome! There are lots and lots of people right across Australia and truly we're having a lot of fun through the last month, but we got more to do, uh, certainly so. And here's the thing, you can contribute as well. So you'll notice, depending on your device, that there is a chat function. It'll either be on the right hand side of your screen or down the bottom. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself, say hi where you're from, uh, but also if you've got questions, uh, please, uh, you'll see down the bottom of your screen most likely a Q&A spot, a question and answer spot. That's where you can throw questions through to all the panellists, and there's quite a few panellists today, uh, where uh, we can get those answers, either questions either straight to you via text or live during this webinar for sure. Now by the way, there is a lot of diverse people involved in here, and I'm really excited that we're right across Australia, not just in one state, all over the place, and I want to acknowledge all the traditional owners and custodians of our diverse land. Seriously, welcome. I want to acknowledge our elders past, present and our future emerging leaders. We're really excited that you can join us and uh, we're going to have a great afternoon. Now, by the way, there are a lot of people to, uh, you know, meet throughout this session. My name is Ben Newsom from Physics Education. Uh, we also have Stephanie Ruiz and uh, Jackie Cow from Physics Education. You will get to meet very shortly Karen Player from Sydney Science Education. Uh, you'll also get to meet David Foley from the New South Wales Distance and Rural Technologies uh, group out of the New South Wales Department of Education. You'll also meet Sean Sullivan from Cool Runnings Business Solutions. And a lot of the resources that you've uh, been able to see on the Virtual Excursions Australia website have been produced by Heather Catchpole and her team from Refraction Media. Lots and lots of people involved. And uh, before we get going, I thought Karen Player 100% could let you know really a bit about the organisation that's really helped put this together in Virtual Excursions Australia. So I might hand over to you, Karen, and uh, let's take it away. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, so my name's Karen Player. Um, I've been involved in the training sessions um, for the last few weeks um, from Sydney Science Education. Um, but today I'm actually want to focus on Virtual Excursions Australia. So Virtual Excursions Australia is a collaborative network of content providers that was established by myself, uh, Ben, and um, Stephen Bancroft that some of you may remember from the technology web conferencing sessions. Um, and it was all about setting up an opportunity for people that have made mistakes, have had successes, to share all of that information, to really set up a network, a community. And that's how Virtual Excursions Australia um, came about. And it was actually from a conference up in Queensland um, called Questnet that we were sitting around after this fabulous conference, listening to wonderful people talking about getting into doing virtual excursions, looking at different platforms, different technologies, uh, you know, state 
developing state networks and we thought how can we how can we break down some of these um, boundaries and borders and how can we set something up that will enable anyone across the country that wants to do um, digital excursions or video conferencing virtual excursions um, how can we help support those people um, so virtual excursions Australia essentially is a sort of a website portal it also has a social media um, platform that we we use to promote events as well a lot of you would have been seeing the follow-up information um, the videos and the wonderful resources that have been developed by Refraction Media um, sitting on the Virtual Excursions Australia website because that's one of the um, really great opportunities that the website can collate this information and enable you to, to go through and have a look and find out things that would suit you. Whether you're a small organisation or a big national company, there's something there that can help you. And one of the key things Virtual Excursions Australia looks at is creating these partnerships, creating these networks and supplying and sharing information. So every year we put on events. The first one we've got coming up is World Environment Day, where both Sydney Science Education and Physics Education are collating um, their information together into one umbrella event, World Environment Day to then do promotion and we're putting that up on digital platforms. Um, other events that we have run successfully over the years is ClickFest, which was a great opportunity. We ran that in um, November every year and it kind of gave people an opportunity just to try something different that may be a little bit um, unusual, a bit outside the box. Um, and what it enabled, we sometimes would have 30 different organisations um, putting up programs under the banner ClickFest. So it was a great way that we could then promote um, this event, but all of the organisations could list their, um, their programs separately. So it was um, a really a lot of fun. We had robots and dinosaurs um, as some of the programs over the years, big physics science shows, um, lots of different opportunities. And it can be something really small, um, but it also can be a big um, show. Also, uh, especially coming up really importantly, National Science Week, we would run programs for the whole of August called SciFest. And that's another great opportunity to be able to list programs across the whole month of August, um, all related to, to science. Um, Earth Science Week, we would run in October. Um, programs for NADOC Week, Book Week, um, lots of art programs, lots of sort of programs for Harmony Day. One of the fun ones that Ben and I did um, one year was Slime Day, just because we we could. We had um, one of the naturalists that worked with me at the Australian Museum teaching kids how to make post-it notes out of leopard slugs um, with pieces of paper. So you just never know. Um, the, the whole purpose of developing partnerships and creating these networks is, you know, by bouncing ideas off each other, you can come up with things that you never would have thought um, could do. Uh, Pirate Day was a great example um, where we had a National Maritime Museum involved. We also had um, Ben from Physics in Involved. And the other organisations were thinking, oh, how do we get involved? And I think the powerhouse or, um, ended up doing things on piracy, so, um, uh, you know, illegal use of um, information. So it was a really cool balance between, you know, talk like a pirate and getting kids um, to understand um, piracy as well. So really, it's only limited by your imagination. And so the Network for Virtual Excursions Australia is a great opportunity um, to find um, and continue the conversation about um, partnerships and where you can go um, and where your ideas can um, be promoted. So um, in the surveys that have been coming out, there's an option for you to register your interest for Virtual Excursions Australia. You'll end up then going into our newsletter. It's free. Um, you get updated information about any, um, you know, new blogs or videos that we've been putting together. And we will be starting up the network meetings um, in June as well. So after the training session's finished, you've developed some partnerships, you've got some great ideas, it doesn't stop there. Virtual Excursions Australia will help support you through um, your journey into um, virtual excursions. So Ben, I know you've got some great examples there um, to show everyone about how these partnerships can work. So it'd be great to have a look at those now. Absolutely. And uh, by the way, uh, Inspiring Australia State Programs would love you all to hook up and join up and chat around some collaborations coming into National Science Week and frankly beyond. 
So, throughout this whole time, and it gets a bit crazy, the chat goes off the chart soon when we start sharing what we're getting up to, but please feel free to reach out throughout. Now, we know in the recording you can't see these emails and these chats happening. However, trust me, they're happening, <laughs> and um, we hope that uh, you can definitely get some collaborations happening, and there will be some sessions coming up soon where you get to do that. Now, one of the things that came out of Virtual Excursions Australia was... Honestly, disparate organizations hanging out every month talking best practice in how to do this virtual conferencing thing. What that naturally meant is that we suddenly knew people from a whole bunch of different organizations to do cool things. So we trialed out an after school science club and it was supported by Sydney Olympic Park. And also we had uh, New South Wales Digital Real Technologies helping out in the background as well as the Giants and a few other different people. I was just want to share a video. Now those people who watch physics normally know that we don't normally share videos, but this video does help because it visually gets you get a bit of an idea of just what can happen when a whole bunch of people hang out in a space months on end and then try and do something together. So uh, is it right Jackie if you could uh, share that uh, video please? Thanks so much. Hi, I'm Ben from Physics Education. We're a science education company that goes across the globe by video conference as well as visiting schools around Australia. Throughout Term 2, we are going out to several libraries with school-aged students with the help of Sydney Olympic Park to run a video conferencing science club called Leadership It's Not Rocket Science. Hi guys and welcome to the first ever video conferencing science club held in Australia. Say hello guys, how are you doing? Yep, can see you're somewhat excited. Okay, so throughout this full term, we are going to be doing science experiments. My name is Mike and you'll see me from week to week. While Ben is leading uh, you through different experiments, we'll have a bit of a chat about how those experiments might teach us maybe one or two small things about life. It's not just Mike and myself and the library people, you'll also be meeting a bunch of career people in science. I work for the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. What we do is we look after the water resources in the Murray-Darling Basin. So this week we are going to be looking at what milk is made of and what detergent can do to that. Hi, I'm Ariana and I'm here from Hurstville Library Museum and Gallery. I'm the Programs and Collections Officer and today we're actually doing a physics program. And so what are we doing here? We're pouring the vinegar and the milk together and we're going to mix it to see what happens. You should have seen it all clump up. So, have you seen any difference in the ice cream? Um, it's getting a bit thicker. Have you learned anything over the seven weeks? Oh, every reaction has an opposite reaction. What have you guys learned over the past seven weeks? We've learned a lot of different experiments and how things work. Every week we have the giants talking to us. Hi, I'm Joshua from Hurstville and I wanted to ask you, what qualities does a good leader need? Yeah, it's a very good question. Thanks for that, Josh. These days, all footballers must do some sort of study. So how have you enjoyed this program so far? I think it's been really enjoyable. We've got to meet a lot of different kids, a lot of different age groups, and uh, really excited to do all the experiments together. Science Club has given it a real higher level of learning, and the kids have had so much fun that they now know that science isn't a scary thing. She wants to be there every, every week and she'll come and she's come out of a shell, she wants to learn more, to be here and I think that confidence she'll take home with her. Why is the library doing the program? Well, technology is changing and so this is our chance to get a whole variety of science and speakers to come to Mount Druitt, um, Auburn, Hurstville, at, all at the same time through video conferencing and we've never done anything like this so it was a great pilot program. Just now looked at the balloon race and I thought that looked like so much fun. I never had a chance to do anything like that when I was a kid. I've had a really fun time over the last seven weeks and I hope to do it next year. Goodbye. So, thanks for coming along for the... Alright, so uh, look, the idea of that was to give you a bit of an idea of what happens when you get all people in a room. Now, by the way, we did go outside of the network of Virtual Excursions Australia to pull that together. Casino High School was involved with the help of Macquarie University, and we had three libraries involved right across Western Sydney. It was a lot of fun to make happen. The thing is, is that 
There are no real actual boundaries to what you can do when it comes to science outreach via video conference. You can do pretty much what you'd like. As long as you can um, all work together on something that unifies you all as a group and the public wants to consume that stuff. And that's really the challenge and that's the things that we're going to be sort of working through today. Now, the next group person coming up, David Foley, apart from being a great friend of ours, uh, really has a ridiculous amount of experience. Sorry, mate, I'm putting you there. <laughs> you a lot of experience when it comes to uh, the distance learning in a lot of different ways. And I want you to give a bit of an idea of what he gets up to because he has a lot to share. I say, Dave, go ahead. G'day, folks. How are you? Um, look, you're going to see me for a couple of moments and then I'm going to throw on a rolling PowerPoint that is um, evidence that Bonnie Tratt, who you met in one of the previous sessions, my fabulous collaborator, um, and she's been working with me for a long, long time and helped me invent what we do here for the Department of Education. Um, and I've got to call out that um, Ben and Karen are amongst two of my oldest, longest collaborators with virtual excursions um, for Dark Connections. That's our organisation or our website that uh, coordinates all the, the content for schools in New South Wales. And we don't stop anybody else getting access to it either. Anybody can join it. So Dark Connections. Um, but I've got to acknowledge the very first virtual excursion provider via video conference in Australia was uh, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, Reef HQ. Um, they, they got going a bit before us and inspired people like me to go for premier scholarships and take off overseas and do research and make great friendships. Um, ben has done the same. A number of other people that I know have, uh, that we have worked with over the years have done the same, really to look at virtual excursions and video conferencing and content. So I work for the Department of Education and uh, we've got roughly 800,000 plus students that we can tap directly into. So we are ready made uh, to go for content. We started building video conferencing um, as early as 1998 and testing that. And then when IP telephony got going, it really kicked off in 2002 through 2005 before the connected classrooms got going. We also look after all the satellite network for distance education here at Adobo. So we use that as well to put our content over. Right, so um, I'm in so impressed that there are so many of you here from so many different org organisations. I've been watching the chat, Ben, and you're right, you said you can get away, you can put pretty much do anything and make it relevant if you can find people who want to watch it. And what I find is, and I'll re repeat this later, if people are passionate about what they know and love and do, you can enthuse people to watch it. And um, looking at a lot of the, the chat, um, there's people from organisations that are on my bucket list to do things with. So um, I might retire and just go out and hook into it. Um, all right, so I'm going to start my, my PowerPoint. I'm going to share my, my screen, probably clumsily. Um, there it is there. And I'll start it. And it's just going to play in the background um, while I speak. So, Ben, you still have me? hear me? Happy? Go for it, mate. Uh, right, my little, I'm not quite doing a halo, but I'm in between the lights. No, you're good. Um, you're going to see Bonnie and I and others from our team who some of the some of the content that we've produced over the years. This was the very first one. This was with the CSIRO with the Anglo Australian Observatory, um, and it was about 12 years ago. And um, we partnered from the very beginning. We've very rarely done content ourselves without partnering, we've always partnered. Um, I asked Bonnie today to estimate how many partner groups, that organisations we work with, and we, we couldn't measure it. We couldn't measure it. So over 12 years, there has been a lot. Um, our team is very fortunate. fortunate. We've just worked with the best people. Um, we've uh, done collaborations with Australia, Japan, Korea, New Zealand, USA. Um, the hard ones like Hawaii, Alaska, even NASA and Texas has been a long time provider of content for our schools. Um, we've been pelted with fruit at the fruit markets uh, by uh, people who didn't want to be filmed because they were illegal immigrants working. Um, we've done stuff from Lake Mungo live, so you'll see them and I'll refer to some of them as we go along. So what I'm going to talk about is the current and future demand for content by schools 
and from other organisations like aged care, hospitals, clubs, government agencies and even businesses who might take your content, either for their kids or for themselves, um, to, to train them up on how to use this thing. Um, how's the content is best designed, programmed and delivered from your institutional group? Um, Ben's right, collaborating with somebody is the very best way to get going. Uh, we, we've, we've done a lot of collaboration and we work with a lot of people. You can see I used to have hair colour and people that you might have forgotten by now. Um, so the answer, is there a demand for content? Is there, is there an appetite? Um, from schools, yes. We've just come through COVID-19. We've been doing all the COVID-19 strategy, but our world is kind of back to normal because schools went back on Monday. And... Um, as such, we're, we're, stop, we're about to stop producing special content for parents to deliver at home with their kids, and we think teachers are going to come back um, really ready to go. The other big difference is they've transitioned to Zoom. We've all of a sudden got 60,000, 70,000 teachers in the state who are absolutely fantastic at Zoom. So, um, so I believe our teachers will come back ready. Um, I think there is a market for you guys with groups other than schools. Schools will definitely, definitely want to take your content, New South Wales and beyond. Zoom's so easy now. Um, before we had just video conferencing, we had one room in every school and that one room in every school, a teacher had to book it. And uh, in a moment, I'll see my loop go around. I'll probably stop sharing. There we go. I'll stop sharing and come back to me. How's that, Jackie? All good? Yep. So um, I, I believe that with Skype for Business, Skype, uh, Facebook Messenger, there's numerous applications out there, and they're not too hard. They're not too different. They don't require specialist rooms. They just need to be able to get the, the content from a laptop or a PC up onto a big enough screen so that it can be watched. The other problem is audio, and they need, that, that takes some work to actually get good audio from a class or a large group of people. Um, we've done work with the school magazine and we've done work with a, a group that I work with out of Orange called History Here. And you might have seen the kids dressed up as bush rangers and bush rangers across the back. We won a Magna Award for that, um, and that was uh, Ben Hall Live. And effectively it was uh, five films that we made with schools, and then we went live from the place where the Siege of Canoundra happened. It was 1863 daytime TV, and we did two lessons that are hour long, one for the international um, market for them, we gave it free, and then uh, for our schools, and both, both were fantastic. The kids that we had were brilliant. The whole community of Canoundra got into it. They got all their horses out, their stagecoaches out. It was a whole community collaboration, a whole community partnership to do the most fabulous event. Um, so just thinking about, so with the school magazine and with um, the Australian National Maritime Museum, we've done quite a lot of work on the Second World War and the war in the Pacific, and we've been researching um, stories that haven't been told properly. And then we tumbled across a lot of the people who hold those stories are in aged care or maybe still independently living at home, very unlikely. And I think there's, there's, there's room particularly for Australian National Maritime Museum, War Memorial, uh, Horn Island Museum, um, the uh, World War II Museum up and down, all those sorts of places and many, many more to tailor content that is age and history specific to the, those clients. Um, sporting clubs, Ben works with Greater Western Giants. Uh, they're fantastic. We've done stuff with AFL, NRL, um, uh, other sporting codes, other, other sports. And um, I reckon there's a, there's a market for that too. And there's also, I think the, after the COVID-19, um, with the parents, I'm hoping they're all out there thinking, kids are back at school, that's it. I, don't, I want to see the back of it. I want to have anything to do with their learning again. What I hope is that they want some sort of um, experience that they can do with their kids. Imagining, imagine on a Friday night, turn off the TV instead, they register for a live video session from Longreach or from Qantas or from Reef HQ. I saw the children's, um, the children's Museum in there from the universities. What about courses, learning about courses um, that you students could go into? 
What about training parents to be more proficient and understand what teachers are talking about and what's happening in schools? Um, so TAFE, there is so much that could be done to deliver to that after-hours market for school for parents and families and also for, um, for, uh, for the weekends. Um, now, um, we have a struggle with schools, and I'll admit it. The struggle with schools is that every school, every classroom, every teacher does what they call programming, scope, and sequence differently. High schools, the first thing a high school new deputy will do will create a new variation on a timetable that is not a five-day timetable, it's a 15-day timetable with a backflip with two U-turns, uh, with some 40-minute, some 50-minute, some 60-minute um, lesson times. It's too hard. Um, so I'm going to talk about very briefly about the difference between live and interactive that we're doing now, with streaming we do, and the opportunity to record. So with dark connections, we were purely about video conferencing and we had to change that. We had to open up to Zoom and other applications. Plus, we had to allow for live content, content by request so that you could open yourself up so that um, people could actually come to you, schools, institutions, groups could come to you and say, look, I want to, I want to book you for this session on this date. And this is the sort of content that I'd like, that you might be, leave yourself open to that. And then recording it and making it available so you end up with this library and repository. Um, you might find, this is one something we've found, so you saw Costa in there and you saw some other personalities, um, Dr Carl. Um, sometimes your experts are pretty dry. Look for, if, if it's going to be a big effort, Pay for someone to come and be your anchor and your host. You might find you've got a brilliant communicator slash clown slash expert slash passionate person who could actually, from your organisation, could actually get in there and do the presenting. Um, I reckon that's, that's a real trick and that's something we've done. But make sure they're passionate. I mentioned that earlier. Um, so... I'll just talk about a couple of examples. Schools talk about scoping, sequencing, timetables, the year program. We just can't target it necessarily. But there's been a few groups who have done incredibly well by claiming the week and theming it. Um, NADOC week, science, the science week, science festival in August that a lot of these people have been involved in over the years. And um, the home program. Like, so getting together, collaborating and owning it, you will get schools to respond and they'll start to program. You advertise out well, they will program to fit. You could possibly do the same thing for aged care. If you're doing stuff on World War II, on cooking, on music, on food, on dancing, whatever, you could, you could be doing those sorts of things. Um, we love to give advice. You're welcome to ask. It's free. Contact us. We'll happily advise with technologies, presentation styles, tricks and tips, big, big mistakes you can make, um, equipment. Um, we'll, we'll happily share all of that. Um, we've got a few groups now in the Department of Education in New South Wales, actually I think there's four now, who are uh, able to do incredibly complex streaming from multiple places. Um, one of the ones you saw there was pictures you saw of us, was us out at Lake Mungo. So I'm talking about our most extremes. Absolutely most extremes are. Uh, we took our satellite rig out to Lake Mungo and we took of kids from all around the world and from New South Wales and other parts of Australia to the Lake Mungo Youth Forum. We did backwards importing. We brought kids in from Alaska, Korea, China and Japan and Hawaii into Lake Mungo. We even had students, Inupiaq students in northern Alaska, northwestern Alaska, dance and provide cultural stories to our students while out in the desert in the middle of nowhere. Um, we've done streams from Pearl Harbor. Um, we've done or projects from Pearl Harbor. We've done uh, with that live with Costa was from Tokau College. So um, we've done Shark Week. You saw the shark people there, people the shark jaws. 
we got access. We do projects with the Department of Primary Industry um, on sharks, and we got the best, the best shark researchers in Australia going live from Australia's bitiest beach. We had many thousands of students register and participate in that. Um, I took kids to the salmon run up in northwestern Alaska live with underwater cameras and all the Anupiak kids up there taking to that. We've had snake handling um, that just about went badly. Um, we had Tasmanian devils um, from the Taronga Zoo that almost went badly. Um, we've loved it. It has been an incredible journey. If this is something you're thinking that you want to do and you want to partner with people, this is the best forum. You've got the best in the world right here, right now. And uh, I commend them all to you. Thanks for having me along. Hey, thanks so much. And uh, Jackie, 100% will have questions coming to you from there. So uh, Jackie, what do we got? Uh, David, we've got some questions for you. The first one comes from Jenny. What's the best way to approach someone like yourself or the Department of Education? How well do you expect a content idea to be? Um, any idea you have, we will never, ever, ever uh, disregard it. We'll, we'll hear it. We might need to develop with you to make it more interesting. We might need to drive it into curriculum, to, so match for curriculum for schools, to contact us. Um, david.foley at det.nsw.edu.au or bonnie.tratt, T-R-A-T-T, at det.nsw.edu.au. And um, I'll put my phone number up on the chat. Um, you're most welcome to, uh, to contact us. Um, and um, we'll talk with anybody, um, private schools, anyone will tell you. Uh, we're, not, we're not jealous uh, at all about... Um, hiding our, our, our expertise and our experience will happily get you going. Um, Kat also asks a question. Uh, she says, we streamed Adelaide Writers Week sessions, uh, not science related, that's all right, um, in aged care facilities, but the feedback was around participants not being able to hear or see well due to their physical limitations. Is there any advice as to how to best set this up with tech that helps? Um, that might be a project where actually buying a kit that goes to that place for your event. Um, it might be that you're providing a big screen um, if, and uh, you, we, we generally not allowed to put up anything that's not closed captioned. So we often pre-record a lot of content and put it up closed captioned. And the Department of Education is very, very particular about going double A, uh, closed uh, captioning accessibility. Um, I'm going to think about that for you. I, I'm, I'm wanting to think closed loops with um, earphones or headsets. Um, I, I think it's going to require either very loud equipment in the room uh, that's echo cancelling. Um, I'm using an echo cancelling microphone here and now um, so that I can hear really well. Um, it's boosting it from the computer and it's not feeding it back in through through uh, through the set. There are lots of pieces of equipment like that. Um, I'm going to think about that for you, Kat. Um, email me. Ask me that question again. Thank you for that, David. Um, we've got Two more questions, if that's all right. Um, one's from Nikki. Interested to hear about the development of storyboards for the filming that you do. Essential or more free-ranging? When we're pre-shooting, we started out with free-ranging and we overshot, 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 overshot. The most expensive part of just about any filmmaking is the editing. It is my... I, I, Personally, I like editing small things, but when it's a big project, I go nuts. Um, I pay people to edit. I'll pay people double to edit, just about. So um, have storyboarding and making it pretty tight um, is, is very important. Awesome. Thank you. Just one last question before we go back to Ben. Um, Jackie, a, a different Jackie, not me. Uh, Jackie asked... Has anyone had success introducing online content partnerships with regional museums, galleries, and libraries? All amazing partners to work with in terms of life science, but what about online? Absolutely. Um, I'm in Dubbo, 
uh, we connected the uh, Double Regional Art Gallery um, Cultural Centre um, and they did a lot of content for us. Um, the Bathurst Fossil and Mineral Museum, that's where we, uh, with Paul Stafford, um, with the Bathurst, Bathurst Fossil and Mineral Museum, we won uh, one of our, our first Magna Award. Um, the, the Ben Hall uh, project was with the Orange Museum. Um, there, it, I think there's incredible potential. Um, honestly, the technology we use to connect is 4G. And sometimes when our modem doesn't, it plays up, we connect with 4GX just via our iPhone. We actually stream through that. Um, we do have a satellite rig and we do have, you know, high powered, high gain motors and things like that. But there have been times we've come down to 15 seconds before going live. And we've had to switch to the iPhone. Ben, you've been there. Karen, you've been there. So um, it's, it's, it's very easy to do. And, and regional stories are incredibly important. And, um, and I know people who will help you write grants to get your content up. So get in contact with me. I'll put you on to very, very skilled grant writers. Um, we did a great project uh, last year with the White Cliffs Thermal, Sol Thermal Solar Power Station. And um, we ended up recording two films. Um, one was a dry film about how it worked and the history. And we worked with the kids from the White Cliffs School and the School of the Air uh, at Broken Hill. Some of the kids live around White Cliffs. And we started working on a film script and it wasn't a zombie film. It was sort of semi-post-apocalyptic because that's what it looks like out there. Um, I'll put the link up later for you. But the kids wanted it to be a zombie film. So they actually took control of production. And it's a cracker. It was so funny and so, so fun to shoot in a day and a bit. Um, but even little places like White Cliffs, if you've got 4G and you've got basic equipment, you can do incredible stuff. Um, an iPhone with a DJI gimbal and a little microphone, a little plug-in microphone. Incredible. You can do great stuff with that. Um, Get in contact. David, sorry, just while you were answering that question, a bunch of other questions came in. <laughs> uh, so if you don't mind uh, answering a couple more. Um, Nell asks, how do you budget for your video documentation? Uh, that's a big question right at the moment. Um, the budget, sometimes it comes through grants. So we actually will partner with a group and or a museum and we'll write grants, we'll go for grants. Um, we've got one for inspiring, with Inspiring Australia that we're going to be doing over at Wellington fairly soon, uh, Wellington, New South Wales. And um, uh, that's with the history here, guys. And um, so we, grants help pay the other people. And I've, I've, held the, I've held the belief that if it's content that our schools are receiving, and we do get city schools registering, mostly regional schools, rural, regional. And um, if we're getting them our content, we, we commit our time, provide our time and our expertise and our equipment and we'll travel and do it. And that's a fairly minor cost. If there's probably a real cost with salaries, but because we're working for our schools, and our rural schools that we are really charged with supporting, we don't charge for that time. Um, occasionally we've got to charge for or put, put a cost against our travel. Um, and uh, the other times uh, we might get money from the Department of Education because it's something they particularly want to do. Or the museum has a budget or the institution has a budget and says, come here and do it. But more often than not, it has been... Um, like a, a free exchange between the two entities. But those days are probably numbered. We probably do need to, um, to recover costs, some costs. Um, Caroline asks uh, the last question. When offering an online program, what are some tips to decide whether to go live, like choosing Zoom or Facebook Live, or whether to pre-record a session to offer? Uh, and the, and, and the in-between which is pre-recorded session that you then present live, right? Um, look, we, as I said before, our primary schools, we can pretty much be assured that we will get a very big audience. If I go and get a rock star like Ben Quilty or Dr. Carl or 
Adam Spencer or Costa. Um, if I go and get a rock star like that, the high schools will make a special effort. Um, interestingly, science, art and music are the biggest, and history, are the biggest attendees that are attended by high schools. Um, so it depends on when. Look, we, we've got to find out if there's sports carnivals on or areas, area things on for sports or a football knockout or school spectacular. So we've got to work around big events like that so that we know we're going to get an audience. Um, sometimes you might need to record it because it's, you've got that talent available at that time and then you might then run a live session via Zoom that you anchor and present it and put it out. It also depends on whether you want that live and interactive connectivity. We used to do it all live and interactive. We hardly recorded anything for the first, what, seven or eight years. Hardly recorded a thing. We're protecting Ben's income stream, Karen's, Karen's uh, work plans um, and workflows. We're protecting them so they can repeat it over and over again with class by class by class. Um, but we don't do that so much now. But you do, I do love live and interactive. It's a really authentic experience that, that is for those children. If you want them to go to you, come to you and say, I met, sorry, who was this, Carolyn, wasn't it, uh, Jackie? Yep, Carolyn. If you want them to say, to go home from school and say, today, what did you do? Oh, we met Carolyn. And she told us about such and such. And then we looked at such and such and we pulled this apart and we saw this and we learned about this. So actually, if they go home and speak in first person about their experience, that's a really authentic live and interactive, and I, I, I commend that. Um, so, uh, and, but you wouldn't do that. If you're pulling in a big name, you wouldn't be doing that every week or every month or even every quarter. Um, so it, it's horses for courses, and I'm happy for you to give me a phone call. I'll put, as I said, I'll put my number up in here. I'll be brave. Um, it's a government phone, so it's okay. Um, and... Um, and I'm happy to have that discussion with you because um, sometimes so those ones, we did a whole pile of sessions with Antarctica, Australian Antarctic. It took me three years to convince them to do it. In the meantime, we faked it once with someone who used to, two people from Dubbo who used to work in it. One that still does work in Antarctica and the other one, the kids didn't know any different. And then when we finally got to do the session, we convinced Australian Antarctic to, when we convinced Australian Antarctic, to put an N-class wireless loop around there, send down iPads, tripods, and we got approval to do stuff during the winter. The first thing they did was they put, connect us to a comms room. We got the comms technician in a, in a black T-shirt in a comms room with misty windows. No one believed it was Antarctica. So we got them to go outside in the winter and show us the big vehicles and what they do and what they eat and how they, how they play virtual darts and all that sort of stuff. Um, then they believed it. So that was worth doing live. And our kids said that they went to Antarctica. So it um, depends on your, your, your intent, I'm going to say, and depends on your talent and the tying. There's a, there's a lot of ingredients. Um, good question. Um, I do think about this, and it's something we think about every time we go to do something, is how we're going to do it, how we're going to present it. Thank you so much for that, David. Um, I'm going to uh, go back sure. to Ben for introduction of the, our next speaker. Absolutely. And uh, by the way, if you're sitting here wondering, uh, is this just about schools? No, not at all. I guess you can work across a bunch of different places. In fact, maybe you have to consider about how could you have a blended program where you could have a retirement centre connected with a museum or a library audience who are adult learners through your families and schools involved. In, it's all can be, it's all up for grab. You just go plan that out accordingly. Um, but one thing you do need to do plan is actually the tech itself. And actually David did mention that, you know, there are different ways of dealing with this. Um, but sometimes perhaps it may not be in your world to be able to deal with the tech directly. Um, maybe you might need to have a background partner. So what we wanted to do was actually uh, have a chat with a techno te technology organization who partners with other organizations and has heard what it's like to work with third party groups to be able to get a project off the ground in multiple ways. So uh, I want to introduce Sean Sullivan from uh, Cool Rodding's Business Solutions. And uh, Sean, would you like to take away what you get up to? Ben, thank you. Thank you to everyone, David. Uh, that was really, really interesting too. Um, we've got a few crossovers there of, uh, of some people um, in Dr. Carl and Adam Spencer. Um, let me get my screen started and jump into it. I've only got a very, very short time. 
Ben, just double checking there. We can see the screen. Yes, you can. Yes, I Great. can. Great. Fantastic. Partnering for Impact Technology Partners. Running through, again, Sean here from Business, uh, Cool Running's Business Solutions. We are basically a business process and dig digital transformation company. I've been in this space, in the value stream space, for more than 20 years. Uh, you might say, well, what's that got to do with science? Uh, have an open mind, have a listen, um, and we'll get there and I will answer that question for you. Uh, I do want to give you a disclosure though. It's very important that what we do discuss today, especially what I'm discussing, is really just general advice, okay? I don't know your independent situations, uh, and the, the advice, particular to you, might, revolve, might involve another conversation. Uh, I'll, straight up from the front, Cool Runnings is a Zoho partner, okay? We're an authorized global partner of Zoho. They are a software, uh, so you'll see them pop up th throughout this presentation. Uh, I am going to be as agnostic or software agnostic as I can, uh, and I will definitely not be slagging any other software in preference. Uh, you're all specialists in your field. I'm not an educator, as I said. Uh, I am a solution specialist. Uh, with uh, actually went to university with uh, inspiration, Australia, inspiring Australia's own jazz chambers. Uh, we've got a short time together, and this is just one very, very small, tiny piece of a very, very large puzzle. I'm going to go quite quickly, so don't worry if you're, if you're not catching everything or you've got questions that pop up later. This is being recorded. You can rewatch, uh, and there's plenty of opportunities to either ask directly after this uh, or in an offline forum. Uh, again, just general advice. This, uh, you all have different requirements, different budgets, different legacy systems, uh, and some of you also have contractual arrangements of what you can and can't use. Uh, and before Cool Runnings would develop a technology profile, uh, we've worked with Ben, we worked with Karen uh, 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 on, on other collaborations, but we would also go through and we would actually get the requirements and then we would design something for you. Uh, technology, don't look at it in isolation, okay? It's part of your whole ecosystem. It's part of your whole delivery system. The system that we look at uh, within Cool Runnings, we simplify it down to three real things, and that's process, employees, and technology. Uh, everything, everything that we can talk about revolves around those three things. Uh, just coming through here. Uh, my my mantra, uh, and as I have said, is said in my bio, I am a process fanatic. Everything is a process, and the process is everything. Uh, that that I, I take that to uh, making a cup of coffee, optimizing my kitchen back when I had my re renovation, working within business. Uh, uh, we. David was just asked a question there of storyboarding. Storyboarding is a process. Everything has a process. You start, you end. And the importance of the process is for consistency, scalability, okay? So it doesn't matter whether you are now just starting out as a science presenter or you are, like David, running a, a very large organization with inside there. Consistency, scalability, everyone's on the same page, clarity and control, and most importantly, if you're following a process, doesn't matter whether it's the right process, it's the baseline for improvement. So, I've got a poll question here. With all the different processes that are around, you've got your, your, your finance process, your HR process. Does anyone have, or what do you have, your customer process, your customer journey? So, within that, 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 that could be, and I'm talking about, if you're in schools, the journey of the child going through there. If you're uh, STEM presenting to um, 
let's say it's a, a science trivia show. Okay, uh, held at the local at the local RSL or the local pub or community centre. Do you have a process of w attracting your client? Okay, attracting your customer, going right through how they how they get on, like we have in Zoom, whether the emails, uh, how you finish, and how you follow up. Okay, so they just if you just like to click yes or no, uh, and if I can get from Jackie there. Some feedback on the poll. Yep, uh, just letting everybody know that you will not be able to see the poll questions unless you have come in uh, to the webinar via the Zoom app. So if you joined from your browser, whether it's Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Microsoft Edge, um, you won't be able to see the poll. Um, at the moment, we have about just over half of our attendees um, having voted. And it good looks sample like, size. yeah, it, it's, it's pretty good. Um, at the moment, it looks like the majority of our friends um, have not got any okay. document. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, and the reason I'm just asking that question is it's just going to drive the next few questions, the next few minutes of where we're going. Uh, of the slides there. Okay, so, well, we've gone too far. Some of the softwares, before we jump into customer journey, some of the softwares that are available, and I just threw these up on, uh, up on some post-it notes uh, and stopped after about a minute's worth of typing, okay? We've got their softwares for finances, marketing, solutions, support, delivery, website, office. Uh, we've got collaboration softwares. There's a lot of softwares available. We're going to drill down on just a few, and it's a few around that collaboration area. So another question, and this is, I just want you to answer this in your own head. How are you communicating now? How are you communicating with your customers? How are you communicating with your target market? How are you communicating with your partners in, in putting together something? How are you communicating post, uh, post presentation? There's an email, messaging app, there's video conferencing apps, we're using one now, phone or face-to-face? -face. There's more than that, uh, but just, just having a think there. Another thing that, that, that comes in collaborating and making collaborating work so efficiently uh, is where are you storing your data? Is it single repository? Is it cloud-based? How many copies of that piece of data are circulating around? Okay. Uh, who has access to it and can you cover, recover lost data? When you are collaborating with a group, whether it's internal or whether it's external, multiple copies of the same document tend to be generated. If you are emailing a document, all of a sudden the different people are working on a different document. If the, if the, if the document or the video or the spreadsheet, whatever you're working on is held in a central repository and you're sharing that document, you can make changes, everyone sees the changes. Uh, and also around that is you can revoke access, you can immediately give access to people outside your sphere, okay? Uh, and there's also great avenues for lost data recovery. When you're choosing a software, okay, and when we're choosing a software for any part of your customer journey, Okay, now again, if you haven't got that customer journey, that is the outcome that I would like for you to think about after this is what is a customer journey and how do I map it, okay? The, the, the importance about the softwares, okay, the, the journey is software agnostic. The customer journey does not care about the softwares that you are using, okay? The software doesn't have to be perfect, okay? It has to be fit for purpose, okay? There was a question there just before on Facebook live streaming. If you're streaming, if your target market is under 13, 
Facebook's not good for you. Okay, straight, fair and simple. They shouldn't. Be, ch children shouldn't be on Facebook under 13, uh, and it's just a not not a safe environment to control at that area. The getting back to the uh, back to the process. Where are you starting from, and where do you want to get to? Okay, and this is really, really, really important. Free is not free. Okay, there is always a cost. There is an opportunity cost. Okay, that is always involved. It might be the free software is the right choice for you, but there is always a choice. It doesn't need to be expensive, but there always needs to be a return on investment. And that's how we go and have a look at what should we be investing. Again, for people that are just starting out, picking the correct platform, okay, and there is free versions of that platform is fantastic, but picking the platforms with the end in mind or the next big milestone for technological, technological change in mind. Running through, okay, app smashing. This is something to have really, really in mind, especially with your customer journey. And it's about combining different softwares and applications together. Okay, either within your organization, between multiple organizations, between you and your end user. Okay, there's a few things. One, you have multiple subscriptions. Two, there's incompatibility. Uh, the, the biggest one, and we have seen this through this COVID-19, and the people that I've been talking to helping is, hey, I need to have five or six applications open just to be able to get onto this presentation. I need my emails, I need my Zoom, I need my notes, I need my, um, pick another platform there, uh, Skype, okay? All of these different things, am I using it on my phone, or am I moving from my phone to my tablet, am I throwing it up onto my, um, onto my television, or am I sitting like I am right now in front of my, in front of my PC with another screen? Take into consideration the pain points of collaborating and app smashing. Okay, very, very quick question. And again, um, if you haven't come in through, if you're not using the actual Zoom app and you're using it through, uh, through the browser, you won't be able to answer this. But the question is, is Zoom a collaboration software? I'll be very interested with the answer. Uh, we've had some feedback from one of our participants saying that they're joining in via the web browser, yet they could see the poll. So that was that was some interesting updates that uh, may have occurred. Um, All right, we Zoom, Zoom, Zoom's rolled out a release that we don't know about. Uh, uh, okay. okay, so it looks like over 60% of our participants have voted. And the majority, so about three quarters of them, have said yes. Okay. It, it, it's, a, it, 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 it's a subjective question, uh, but I will say no. Okay. In the true sense, Zoom is not a full collaboration software. It, Zoom is a delivery software. Okay. Yes, we're talking and we're collaborating right now. Some of the others that are real collaborative, okay, and... Again, this is horses for courses, software for software, okay? What we're doing right now is a webinar to 100 plus people, okay, that's being recorded, that's got multiple presenters, okay, multiple panelists. We've got Zoom is working exactly fit for purpose for that. Some of the other collaboration softwares behind the scenes, okay, are uh, areas where you can have same time chat okay and here we're looking we've got just i've thrown up a couple of popular ones slack uh click that's soho click microsoft teams facebook 
Google Hangouts, and right in the middle I've thrown one Stormboard. Okay, Stormboard is a great collaboration tool. It's what I made the post-it notes for, uh, used for post-it notes. It's what uh, Ben and I use. It's what I use with my other clients. But when we are brainstorming and starting to get together a storyboard, starting to get together an idea, as opposed to trying to do it in something, Thing like uh, a, a, a process flow software like Microsoft Visio or Lucid Chart or something like that that's actually more time consuming than being able to quickly throw down some ideas. Okay, these all have video capability. They also, and when I'm talking about Facebook, I'm not talking about Facebook Messenger, I'm talking about Facebook, uh, I think I believe it's called Teams or something like that. There is a, there is an application for businesses and organizations to, to have that within there. These are great tools to be able to quickly transfer files faster than emails and things don't get lost. Popular office suites, okay. Again, these I've put three suites up here where you can share the document and collaborate with the document as opposed to sending the file. And that's Microsoft Office, Google Docs, and Zoho Office Suite. Cloud storage. Again, if you're not, if you're going to share, you need to be able to share to there. I would be surprised if if everyone does not know Dropbox uh, for sure, but OneDrive, which is the Microsoft product, Google Drive, and Zoho, which is the work drive. Okay, I'm just going to flick back before I show you this this thing. Okay, so we've looked just here now at. Um, a couple of the technologies that allow you to collaborate both with inside and outside your organization uh, that could be used in different points of that customer journey, could be used in the different points of building out your storyboard, could be used in um, it, it, just in, in your day-to-day -day business, not even around your presentation, okay? Collaborating with your team on other things. Cloud storage, same time or, or, or chat that, and uh, also uh, they're a office suite that is able to be used in the cloud, okay? They're the things there. I'd like to sh just change gears for one quick second. I'm going to show you here a product here. Uh, it is a Zoho product, be, be warned, okay? But it's something that Ben and myself have been collaborating together and collaborating with Zoho again. So you know, I, I collaborate on both levels for technology. This came across where Ben and I, oh God, 12 weeks ago now, uh, sometime around there, COVID-19, how are we going to deal with this? What are we going to do? How do we get out to the masses? I went back to my technology partner and said, hey, what's going on? How can we do this? And they said, Sean, have a look at something that we're working on. Okay, this is not out in the marketplace yet. Okay, you cannot buy it. Okay, unless you're in India. Okay, right now, this is not out in the marketplace. It is almost there. It's new to market. Okay, we are in beta testing. <clears throat> and this is called Soho Classes. Everything can be done from a mobile or a tablet. Okay, it has... Um, a powerful back end, okay, it's got the CRM, which is your customer resource management. Uh, if you put that into, that, that's where you put your classes, that's where you put your students, okay. The, the learning management system, that's where you uh, are able to put um, all your courses, or, or your stuff like that. It has e-commerce within it. Uh, we were talking about live versus uh, not live before. Okay, synchronous, asynchronous, and somewhere in between, does all of that. Data storage, students can download and upload. Uh, it's been built with screencasting in mind. Uh, one of the big things, and I've had it even in my house, is competition for devices. Okay, uh, Australia has gone back at the moment. I'm I, I'm not in Australia. I'm I, I'm I'm abroad. Uh, we're not going back. Uh, and competition for devices in this household. 
uh, is massive. So the the beauty of the beauty of this this new product that is coming out is you can use a telephone or a smartphone, and you can throw that up onto a television, uh, onto a smart TV, uh, and watch. Instead of watching on a tiny screen, you could watch a presentation. Uh, Privacy in mind, security in mind, and child safe. Again, this is just in beta testing. The only reason I really wanted to bring this up is to show you the collaborations that are possible. Okay, the collaborations that that some of the people here are the 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 the, the partici not the participants, sorry, some some of the uh, presenters here are working on behind the scenes. If you want to know more, contact Ben or contact myself. Okay, and again, it is not at release stage. Soon to be released, but not at release stage. Um, so, in summary, cho choose the right tools that are for you, okay? Don't get swept up by the marketing. Don't get swept up by uh, peer pressure, everything. Have a look at what you need, okay? And if technology is not your skill set, okay? Seek help, okay? It's not one size fits all, okay? Physics is not my skill set. I would not presume to jump onto Gen Ben's physics education and promote about that. Uh, I would not, pro I, I, I would not promote, uh, you know, tell David how to do his job, okay? If you're not sure about the technology, just ask, okay? Uh, and consider your ecosystem. Don't make decisions in isolation. Now, if you're part of a larger group, okay, uh, don't make a decision in isolation for your team. Work with your group where possible to come up with a solution that fits all, okay? It's very, very hard to undo things that have been done, yet you see it time and time again, whether it's in business, whether it's in clubs, whether it's, you've got different groups running down a different agenda, okay, work together. And most importantly, go back and define your processes, okay? Go back and, and just take that user journey. If you're going to put on something, go and define the process and then have a look at the technologies that you need to be able to deliver a great presentation. That's it, Ben, Jackie. Cool, so we've, I can see we've got um, one question, and we've only got about a minute or so um, before we need to move on, but the, um, there was a question here quickly from Nikki. Uh, thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, she had a question about, we have an issue with needing guarantees with security for collaboration software. Um, being banned from being using Dropbox. Are there recommendations for using very secure software? Nikki, thanks for the question. Again, without knowing exactly uh, what your situation is, I can get, only give you general advice, okay? Uh, now, the, the, the question, the, the, you, you need to sit down and find out what the, uh, what the requirements are of your organization uh, and then start looking at what the, what the terms and conditions and what the SLAs are of the various things. And again, free is where you will end up with the, with the, the most broad terms and conditions. If you're paying for security, you get security, okay, uh, in most cases. I hope that answers it. If if it doesn't, happy to talk to you a bit in private in a in, in a bit greater detail. But before, I would have to ask some more questions to diagnose the answer correctly. Awesome. Hey, thanks very much, Sean. Now, the, you might be wondering. Hang on, this is about partnering for success. You want to hear about partnerships. One of the things that does matter is dealing with multiple organizations talking together, and that's why Sean definitely was in the session, be able to go through some of the apps that are out there. Now, someone who's definitely, thank you very much, Sean, too, but um, much appreciated. Um, he will be around through the questions and answers to ask throughout. But Christian, Christian Eckhart is uh, in from the Royal Botanic Gardens, and he's here really to help us about, really let us, let us know about the... Uh, the science trial that's coming up that he's developing with uh, the Australian Museum and uh, the beginnings of that journey. So, uh, Christian, if you're there, mate, uh, please let us know what you're getting up to. 
Thanks, Ben. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Ben said, I'm working for the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney, and I've been the education manager here for about four years now. And I have to say, as I work between schools and community programs, most of my time is being spent in creating partnerships to put on really uh, nice and uh, nice events for the community. I've pretty much worked with, I think, everyone on that panel. Like I've worked with Karen on like Science Week events, worked with Ben on holiday programs and Science Week events. And I am uh, hopefully about to work with David uh, on our new project for Sydney Science Week this year. Uh, just a bit of background, and I'm just going to take this Science Week project that we're running this year as an example of how partner, working with partners can impact or can lead to a much bigger impact. So we've been running Science Week events for the last 10 years about in the Botanic Gardens. Obviously, they normally are normally like life events on the ground, and they have become one of the largest or some of the largest events in Australia. So Science in the Swamp is attracting about like 13,000 people every year. And it is a platform where our partners can come on board and can show uh, the work and the research they are doing. Most of our partners for Science Week obviously are at Sydney Science Community. And we just love to be the place uh, where uh, Sydney Science Community can come together and can communicate their work to everyone. So it's a it's a community event. It's for kids. We have uh, parts for adults. We have parts for families. So it kind of is literally something for everyone. Unfortunately, obviously this year um, we have been restricted in what we can deliver and decided with the help of Inspiring Australia to go digital this year. Um, together with the Australian Museum, we create a the Sydney Science Trail. I think Ben is just like shooting through the links to uh, the actual uh, to our website at the moment. So the Australian Museum and us we've uh, come together, and we will create a website, a trail that people can follow, and they can open up at their leisure some of the newest content, science content that is uh, available from Sydney's biggest, bigger and smaller science communication, uh, science organisations. So we really have a very curated uh, program. So we work with the Australian Museum, Taronga, uh, the Museum of Applied Arts. So like we've got really the big science institutions uh, of Sydney there, but we also work uh, give like smaller community groups, citizen science projects, the chance to have their say and to become visible for everyone. Uh, it's a really like fulfilling and like a, a task to do this, to um, get everyone together on that website. We'll also have a part for schools in there uh, with the help of Dart Connections. Uh, we'll uh, run a whole school program where teachers can go on and uh, download whole lesson plans, unit plans, and run them through with their kids. There will be panel discussions. And we've got one of the big players in. We've got Dr. Carl, who will be running uh, uh, one of the panel discussions in the little show for uh, secondary uh, schools uh, that will also be available for the community. So the Sydney Science Trail, it's just another sign how important it is to get everyone together to create a really good product that is interest the whole community. If all of us would just like go off and do their own little things and someone runs a little online project here and another online project there, you won't uh, re never reach the impact that we are able to reach when we all come together and hit the market with one big product where we all uh, contribute to. Um, especially like the, it gives the chan a chance to the smaller groups like little uh, citizen science projects that would never re have that impact if they wouldn't partner with someone. Uh, obviously, you always need money to do these things. Uh, that's always the crux. That's another thing which I found in like having worked for the Botanic Gardens for a while. I always find it's better if a bigger organisation bundles up content from smaller organisations as well and then goes to someone and applies for a grant uh, and has all those letters of support from other organisations, the chances that you come through with the grant are much bigger than if all those smaller organisations go out and apply for the grants themselves. 
um, because, as I said, the impact itself will be much bigger. At the moment, uh, we are running an expression of interest. So if someone in those 97 participants that I see here in the, in the discussion is interested, has a, has a project that they want to present, let us know. The link is, there's the Australian Museum link there. I can send through another link uh, that has directly my contact details in this as well. Um, if you have a project and you were thinking about getting it out there, contacting the community about it, let us know. We, do, we have some funding. We will create content with you that we can put on our Sydney Science Trail website. Any questions then? Uh, yeah, we do have questions for you, Christian. Um, Nell asks, how do you connect events on the Sydney Science Trail? Can you describe how the trail works? Okay. Of course, um, so the Sydney Science Trail will have two components. One will be a school component, the other one will be uh, for um, the community. You have to imagine the community one, I unfortunately cannot just share the design for it because it hasn't been quite approved yet. Uh, you have a beautiful uh, illustrated website and which kind of shows up basically an illustration of Sydney with some of the major signs um, with buttons for some of the major science um, topics. So there will be a topic around plants, about animals, about humans, about technology and about space. On that trail, you can click on them and then uh, different windows will turn up and will lead you to the uh, online content of the organizations. So it can be live streams, it can be uh, pre-recorded videos will be on there. There will be links to podcasts on there. Um, activities, games that kids can play if it's like more on the kids' side. For the school project, it will be uh, proper lesson plans that uh, are with, with online resources that uh, teachers can use in their lessons. Plus, we will run a panel discussion per day with uh, four specialists. We'll have a panel discussion on uh, the big questions of science, uh, on uh, bushfire and climate change, women in STEM, uh, the connection of art and science, why this is important. So there will be uh, changing content. For those teachers uh, amongst you, there will also be a professional, MISA accredited professional development each day. Hope uh, that's your question. Thank you, Christian. Um, we have three questions that I think um, are all really similar. Um, so do the participants have to be in New South Wales? Um, are people in Victoria eligible to seek help? And is there something similar in Canberra or in Melbourne? The good thing about the digital science trail is that it's digital and literally everyone can access it. So it's going to be free. It's going to be accessible by like literally everyone, New South Wales, Australia, and hopefully worldwide can access our content. Um, I'm not sure if there's similar things in Canberra or Victoria. If there's not, send them to us. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have another question from Thomas. Uh, great program. Uh, is this replacing the Science in the City event uh, usually hosted by the Australian Museum? That's right. <laughs> so it's science, because the Australian Museum is closed this year, they actually approached us to have the uh, Science in the City event in the Botanic Gardens, which we started planning and were slightly interrupted by something called COVID-19. So there will not be a, um, an actual event, like an on-site event for Sydney, a Science in the City. There won't be a Science in the Swamp. All those science events will be replaced this year by the Sydney Science Trail. Hopefully, we'll be back to on-site events next year. Thank you. Um, I think uh, one of our participants who asked the question before wanted a clarification because Claire's asking, do the content providers need to be based in Sydney? Uh, it depends. Sorry for that. Yeah, I misunderstood that. Um, the content, if we need to come to you to film, to do a live stream, etc. It would be great if you were somewhere in an in an area that we can access because through through uh, due to travel restrictions we can't go out too far. Um, if you have content that you have produced already that we might use 
might reuse or can re-edit, then we can also uh, take content on from other areas of Australia. Uh, Mike asks, uh, we have at least three interactive programs that would be great. Are applicants restricted to submitting and being funded to one project or program? No, they are not. But I would ask you to curate between your projects and send us not to, like not all your ideas, because we're going to curate them down because like, as everyone knows, the more content is on a website, the more likely it, uh, you are to shut your website, the website down. So you only want to see really good content. You don't just want to have heaps of content on there. So we do, we will curate very severely. So be aware of that when you're sending us your content. Thank you so much, Christian, um, for that very informative section. I am now throwing back to Ben. No worries. Now, one of the things about this is it is about partnering and chatting and collaborating. So here's the deal. I'm going to challenge you. We're going to throw it out there. We have a chat function. So because you're in the chat function, what would be really cool is that what if you just say, this is the thing I'm working on. It doesn't have to be over the top, a sentence, tops. Because what you can do is with control A, you can save the chat. <laughs> so what that means is that you can actually reach out to people really fast. So whilst I'm chatting, I want to see a, like a blur of text going on with people saying, this is what I'm doing and this is where I'm doing it from. The reason why is that there'll be people in locations nearby or frankly, they're on the other side of the country, which means that maybe you could come up with some cool stuff just by knowing what other people are doing. Because this is the thing, I love what Christian said. It's, it's like the, the digital barriers, especially as the consumers, it's only up, up, and I saw David nodding his head before too. The digital is, it, it doesn't really care about borders. What it does care about is time zones, eventually. I mean, obviously, certain grant things have to be around a particular thing. Absolutely, you've got to get that right. But if it's not around a specific grant area, it's, it's jurisdictionally irrelevant, <laughs> doesn't matter. Come up with the cool content and make it so that your public can enjoy it. Now, we only got a few, few, few minutes left, so I want to make sure that we can answer some of the questions that have come up throughout the time. Karen, have you got anything to add uh, while, I've, um, while we wait for some questions to come through? Um, thanks, Ben. Just really want to reiterate what everyone else has shared today. Um, you know, the value of partnering in so many different um, areas thinking about content, but also, you know, looking at great technology partners as well. No one organisation, whether you are big or small, can really do it all on their own. And the value of partnerships really is creating opportunities that you might not have thought about before. So definitely have a look about the Sydney Science Trail that's going to be really exciting this year. Uh, follow up with Sean, follow up with David. And remember, Virtual Excursions Australia is also here as an opportunity to put partners together. So whether or not you want more information um, about Virtual Excursions Australia that I can help answer, or having a look at the content providers and wanting to know how you might get in contact with one of those organisations as well, is a great opportunity as well. Thanks. Absolutely. Now, one thing um, that, that came up in the questions was around content for World Environment Day. It's only around the corner. Um, and actually, uh, Virtual Excursions Australia, 100% is going to be a spot where you can let us know about your content, for mm -hmm. sure. And um, I might actually just say, um, Dave, Dave, I was just catching you up there. With, with World Environment Day over the years, you've seen a lot of different productions that have happened. I mean, one that crosses my mind is the sort of stuff that Sydney Olympic Park would do with the Youth Eco Summit later in the year. But what else have you seen with the Environment Day or environment type presentations that show, you know, good not just presentations, but good collaboration too? Jim's, Jim's, this is Jim about Jim's question here. Yeah? Uh, I saw Jim Cullen's question. Um, uh, look, I've seen some great stuff. Um, everything from getting out in the bush and going live, getting out in the bush with students uh, and community and making short films and sharing those short films. Um, the through to, we're, we're, we're actually, we're looking at a film today done by a Sydney Olympic Park Authority that Karen had something to do with. Uh, for the COVID-19 strategy where they're getting kids to use binoculars and getting to bird hides or make bird hides in the backyard and, and, uh, and count birds and what they're doing, what they're feeding, et cetera, et cetera. All sorts of good stuff like that. Um, I saw a cracker one the other day, a friend of mine shared from uh, Montana and it's pretty rough videos, but the concept is great. So they're using Google Earth and just pinning it but they're going to places and making films about that place. So people from national parks, from the Salish um, Native American community, 
making videos about that place, why that place is culturally important. Um, so I, I could see something like that. You actually end up with like a mosaic of the whole map of Australia with all of you putting your pin and putting your video there to tell everybody about what it is that you do. So you can be searched by map. Um, that would be cool. Very but, but also, but, pardon? That reminds me of Google Sphere. A long time ago, yeah. you could virtual look at everything and only this time it's a video. Yeah, but you click on it and it zooms down and suddenly you're there through the satellite look, uh, satellite view, and then all of a sudden you're in the video of Ben Newsom telling you about why his grass is going yellow or um, Karen telling us about frogs um, in the Botan Royal Botanic Gardens or Taronga Zoo taking us out to one of the ark sites for Tasmanian devils. It, 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 it's limited by your imagination, honestly. It really is. Um, I'd like to get a follow-up with that. So if you do have any programs or ideas you were thinking about for World Environment Day or you've got any pre-recorded content that's already there, um, you know, we can, we can help host that and promote that for World Environment Day. So Ben and I are both offering uh, live paid interactive programs, but there's also lots of opportunities to offer um, free on-demand um, programs as well. So even if you've got, you know, what, say you've got live streams, your organisations of different things or pre-recorded content, we can package all of that up into one big World Environment Day promotion. And if anyone clicks on it, it actually flows back through to your site. So um, that's a really great opportunity that we can create these little packages, those umbrella topics. Um, so yeah, let me that know. Work. Yeah, I agree, Karen, that does work, work well. That's what we did with um, uh, Writers Week which was really only three days, 20 sessions. Some of them were recorded. Some of them were live. We put out... Oh. Internet fun. ...sessions in three days with some of the parallel streams. But we had some registration in the registrations in those three days. Nearly killed us. Don't recommend it. It's, that's extreme. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Dave. All good. So um, one of the things about all these uh, collaboration going on, check out the chat, by the way, it's starting to really hum there, is there's actually um, some groups that have honestly designed to steer us organisation types all together. It says you're inspiring Australia State programs, guys. <laughs> um, reach out to those leaders. They're there to break down silos. I mean, one of the things for partnering for success is honestly being able to find the partners in the first place. That's what Inspiring Australia is actually about. And uh, the uh, hats off for the state programs are able to make this happen, as well as the Office of the uh, Chief Scientist and Engineer in New South Wales. Uh, so I said it around the wrong way, Jackie, but <laughs> you know what I mean. The New South Wales Office of Chief, Chief Scientist and Engineer. Much appreciated. And um, definitely so. Now, I see there's maybe a few questions there, Jackie uh, Cow. What do we got there? Uh, yep, we do have quite a few questions. Um, uh, just a reminder that the session has technically finished now, um, but we are going to be staying on for as long as you guys have questions, basically. Uh, and we will sometimes throw the questions to um, any of the panelists who would like to answer them. So uh, panelists, I can see your video. So if you just put your hand up, if you particularly want to answer a question and I will throw the video to you. Uh, so the first question comes from Nell. What tips do you have to make virtual excursions interactive for students? Uh, Karen. Um, thank you very much. Now, for those of you that might not have made some of the previous sessions, we have a, a whole session that was um, based around best practice um, for engaging your audiences. So the video of both of those sessions, plus little um, snippets of video and also the cheat sheet documentation is all available on the um, uh, Virtual Excursions Australia website. So please have a look at that. But I think Dave, really at the beginning of the talking about um, partnerships, was really mentioning that passion and enthusiasm. If you love your content, you love connecting um, and engaging your audience, it will come across. And that's why it is quite good if you do maybe have an expert that maybe on their own needs a little bit of support. Having a really great science communicator to help facilitate that interaction can then make a presenter who's got great content be a lot more dynamic because of the um, the facilitator and the support there as well. You don't need a lot of 
fancy things going on. You can use simple, simple cameras, simple screen shares, but the, having that engaging content and engaging presenter will absolutely um, help your students or community or your audience get the best out of their session. Uh, Dave, would you like to add something else to that as well? Um, for school students, project-based learning, you actually build project-based learning around it. So the kids have actually come prepared. They're almost experts before they have the session. So you end up with this escalation of knowledge and interaction. And um, we, we used to kind of try and hold our interactive video conferences, the two-way video conferences and sharing of screens, et cetera, et cetera, to six. Remember, Karen? It used to be yep. six. Um, because after six, you had trouble getting around them. A really skilled presenter might be able to deal with 20 but you might only get to each classroom once or twice during the session to ask a question. And there is, with, with the two-way video conferencing, there is nothing more exciting than looking into the room and saying, you, blonde-haired girl down the back with the glasses, come up, I want to ask you something. And you're actually reaching into the room and pulling them out. It becomes way more authentic. It's a bit of a nasty trick, but it works well. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, just to follow up with that as well, there are lots of other tips and tricks to help make those engaging sessions. You can get, even with a, a, a non-interactive session, a live stream, you can still get the people to feel engaged at the other end. If you're asking them questions, you don't always need to hear the answer if you know if you know what it might be. So you can always just throw it in and say, what do you think? And, you know, have a whole bunch of kids in their separate houses or in class or community groups all, you know, talking back to the screen is always a, a really fun opportunity as well but definitely check out the um, best practice um, in engaging audiences sessions um, that are on the website because they're they're all there recorded and saved for you from last week thank you very much karen um, i think we have a question for christian uh, so I will spotlight Christian. Uh, Thomas asks, I noticed in the science trail EOI application, there is the need for a working with children check and public liability certificate. Is this standard for online content? I'm not sure if it's standard for all online content, but as we are a government organization for us, it's definitely standard and every content that is produced for children definitely needs a working with children check behind it. I think David can confirm that. Uh, for working with schools, absolutely. Yep, yep. Your presenters have to have to be um, have a, a child security check, um, and the students themselves. Um, this the principal needs to have cited a signed approval for the students if it's a two-way video conference for the science uh, for the students to be able to be seen over a video conference to be recorded and potentially end up recorded online in a, in a repository somewhere um, and uh, we, we we've been through all the legalities on that and it's um this the, we when the teachers register to dark connections uh they have to check that the principal has cited all the children's um right to be photographed and recorded and uh if there are students in any live production we're doing on site where there are kids involved or if even in video conferences and the students want to be we want to participate, we actually have strategies for them not to get on camera. Thank you, David. Um, we actually have a question for you as well from Nell. Uh, you mentioned you had problems with the Taronga Zoo excursion. What were they and what issues might we anticipate? Uh, the excursions were fantastic. I, 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 in my early career, I was a senior education officer at the Western Plains, Tronga Western Plains Zoo. Um, and I go out there so much that some people don't know that I ever left working there. Um, and they're very, very generous. Both zoos are incredibly generous with working with us and working with content. Um, I shouldn't have alluded to it. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have said. Yeah, but uh, right at the end of the video conference, we're doing this great piece uh, with uh, one of the keepers of won't mention their name, and the little Tasmanian devil turned and bit him on the shoulder in the last few seconds of the video conference. So we closed out with him holding the devil off his shoulder and, and the look of shock on thousands of children, and that's how it ended. 
Yep. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was a long time ago. That was, that was the only problem we've ever had. Uh, children and animals, I believe, uh, David. I, I, I live, live high risk, you know that. Uh, thank you very much for that, David. Um, Antoria has a question. We are a remote not-for-profit and currently share most of our content on our social media channels or in our local small community. Do you have any advice on connections we could make to get our content out beyond our usual reach? Would anybody like to tackle that question? Okay, Sean. Yeah. I'll mute myself there. Uh, Antoria, look, there's a few things there. The, the, the first flag, and I, I'll let this out for everyone, you don't own your social media channels, okay? If you are creating and you're putting all your content onto your social media, it is extremely risky. Have a website. At least get a website, okay? Uh, <clears throat> With your website then, you can then start using uh, basic mail-out software. You can then start SEOing. And these are all, these are all sort of outside of the education side area there, but, but you know, and I'll, I'll let the educators talk about where they can, you can go. Look for collaborations, okay? You're a not-for-profit. You, 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 you look for people there that, that, that are in a similar sphere or have the similar target group and see what you can do to collaborate there and offer, okay? Uh, first and foremost, though, is, is make sure that you've got your stuff backed up. Okay, that, that was just a red flag. Okay, um, I see social media channels getting locked out, blocked, lost, hacked, gone all the time. Okay, that's in business, that's in education, that's personal. Uh, and there's lots of tears and there's nothing that can be done about it. Uh, so, yes, get your own website to start looking at marketing or partnering with a marketing person. Now, that doesn't have to be expensive, okay, and start looking at your strategy. Again, look at your user journey, look at that customer journey, and, and start with the end in mind. So, I'll, I'm going to hand that over to one of the science people there to have a, a talk a bit more about the, how you do it in your business. Thank you, Sean. Um, any takers? Ben? Okay, I'll, I'll quickly just jump in. Um, it's a marketing question in a lot of ways. I mean, it's tough, right? You're in, you're, you're in an um, isolated spot. Making those connections are part of the challenge. And honestly, even if you're in the middle of metropolitan Sydney, Melbourne, wherever, if you don't know anyone or if you don't have if you, you're caught up. So it is, I think, um, leveraging networks by far uh, make, is key, especially if you go beyond... STEM. I mean, one of the things that came up in um, the uh, best practice engaging audiences was this discussion around bringing in arts institutions, cultural organisations, people who are with a completely different network to you. If you create some cool partnerships there, perhaps you actually might produce far more reach than you ever expected. And especially if you put some media. Now, um, I just saw Dave just put his hand up as well about this. Yeah, very quick. Um, and Toria, uh, look, if your content is suitable for schools, get in contact with us. We will put you up on Dart Connections on that site. You get all sorts of promotions. It's free. We'll register. You'll get a portal that you can log into and upload any on-demand videos or um, offer yourself out for by request or do any live sessions. That's, that's free. You'd be welcome to use that if the content's suitable for schools. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we have another question from Arj, and I think this one might be a follow-up to the, our previous question about um, uh, what sort of documentations you need. Along the same lines, does overseas STEM qualified STEM professionals also require some sort of documentation as proof, so related to licensing requirements to run a small STEM engagement business? Anyone like to answer that question? I'll throw in there at least. I've done a lot of um, experience into presenting into other countries, and everyone has different rules. <laughs> if you start thinking on a global scale, the reality is that if you're presenting into um, certain. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think Dave probably best to talk from a New South Wales Department of Ed point of view, but at least 
having experienced the 50 states of the US of all different rules, um, sometimes you just have to fill out the paperwork that they require because um, that just is what it is. But the reality is that it's the end in mind, like Sean was saying, uh, it's to protect the kids. So once you've got the information together, it's, that's important. Dave, is there anything you want to throw into that, mate? I agree, Ben. Ben, it's, um, it's amazing the different places, what they require from you. Uh, here we sort of get our degree and maybe postgraduate degree and that's it. We're good to go um, as long as we pass the working with children checks. Um, overseas, yep, they've asked for all sorts of different things, all sorts of different qualifications and bona fides. Um, there are strategies, there are ways to get your qualifications recognised um, in Australia and uh, if you want to work or do content, produce content in Australia, I recommend you do that. Or apply, take your, take your CV, apply to the Royal Botanic Gardens or to Ronga Zoo or, or to physics education, um, to, uh, you know, when Karen expands, to science teachers. Um, take your CV and see if you can get a job. Once you've got that, you're snagged and you're pretty much in. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. I think that's all our questions answered. So I will throw to either Karen or Ben for our wrap up. I've wrapped up each time. I kind of feel like I hope the I'm like, Karen, did you want to wrap up this time or I can do it? I'm more than happy to, uh, to wrap up the session as well. And this is the uh, end of our the, the three topics, as we mentioned um, on Thursday, if, if you've missed anything, certainly some of you have missed some of the best practice. We're doing a combination session of web conferencing 101 and best practice engaging your audiences on Thursday at 10.30. So I'm sure the, um, the link will get sent out for that one for you as well. Great opportunity to have a little bit of a, a really intense sort of opportunity. Um, it's gonna, it looks like it's going to be a, a relatively small group, so lots of chances um, for conversations. But we will be talking about technology, cameras, audio, and some of those really great engagement techniques um, that we mentioned before as well. Um, and we will have some follow-up sessions helping create and start those amazing networks that we've, we've started connecting today. Um, and we'll be doing follow-up sessions in the next few weeks. So keep an eye on your emails for those dates once they come. So again, thanks to Inspiring Australia and the state partners. It's been wonderful to have you all join us again today. I want to say a thank you to all the panellists that have joined us um, and the great team from Physics Education um, with Ben Newsom, uh, Jackie and Stephanie, helping support the chats and the technology and the Q&As with the conference as well. So thanks to Dave Foley, thanks to Sean Sutherland, thanks to Christian Eckhart and everyone that's joined us today. Every time we do one of these sessions, you know, all the panellists are also learning something as well and it's great to hear um, your questions and to help learn how we can help support you as well. So thank you so much, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye.